Hello everyone, I'm Jack. I'm going to talk about a topic that is too big for a lightning talk, so I'm going to just try and blaze through some stuff. I'm talking about 6502 assembly programming for the Atari 2600. This is this thing. This was something that Atari released in 1977. This was the first really successful home video game platform. Um, everyone has probably seen this. Everyone has probably played or seen some game from this. Um, Atari sold at least 30 million of these between 1977 and 1991 or so. And this actually, this console became synonymous with Atari itself. I think Atari, Atari's eventual failures at selling computers and other things <laughs> were due to them, them being so associated with this kind of crappy video game console. Um, it also became synonymous with playing video games itself. So when I was a kid, playing video games was called playing Atari. It's like, hey, should we go play Atari? Sure, let's go to my house. I've got a ColecoVision. Like, whatever it was, it was a called, could be called playing Atari. The thing was really primitive. The CPU was a 6507, which was a cheaper version of the 6502, a couple dollars cheaper. It had a couple fewer address lines, so they could only address actually like 4K of memory. It had 128 bytes of RAM, so not a huge like working set of anything. Uh, the ROM, you had 2K or 4K on a cartridge. The ROM was all of your code, and that was all the code there was. There was no OS, there was no system calls of any kind, there was no software built in. Um, all you had was the hardware, and the hardware you affected by uh, poking values into certain memory locations. So it had memory mapped I.O. that would make things happen on the screen. Um, I'm going to show a little bit of games so you get a feel for what this thing was. I know a lot of you have seen some of these, and so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. This is the game that came with the system. This was called Combat. It had incredible sound and graphics. Um, this could be like a one or two player thing, actually mostly two player. I think, that, I think there were some CPU driven variants for the computer player, but not much. Here I actually just started a two player game and let myself pound the guy a little bit. Um, what you notice is there's not a lot of things moving on the screen. This is, this is kind of typical for most of these games. There, you have a few things that can actually move around, and the rest are kind of static. Um, the things that can move around and change are what, are called, what they call player missile graphics, what are called sprites, a lot of other systems. And there weren't very many of them. There were actually just two sprites, each of which had an associated ball graphic. And each sprite was essentially eight bits wide. You could, you could make it wider on the screen. So you would have sort of eight bits that could be three different widths on the screen. And the actual, uh, the sprite was actually itself the entire vertical height of the screen. And what you had is you would have code that would run on every, along every line of the screen as the signal was being generated. You could run a little bit of code, which is actually called the kernel. And so here we see, uh, you see a red, you see actually two red sprites and two blue sprites. Those are actually the same sprite being moved into a different position and turned on and off at different times and being given different bit patterns to display things. Um, Here's another typical game from when this thing was launched. This was the basketball game. Here I'm letting the computer player totally dominate over me for a while. Um, I couldn't get a single shot in any, anywhere. The computer player was entirely too aggressive. But as you see, there's not much, there's not much, uh, I tried for a while. There's not much going on in terms of movement. Uh, the players are moving and this ball is bouncing around and that's about it. Interestingly, it's interesting, the colors are changing all the time, and this is because they wanted to prevent video images from being burned into a CRT. So a lot of games, if they had a very extremely static background like this does, they would just change the color into random colors now and then. Pretty different. Um, there was also a famously terrible version of Pac-Man for this system. Uh, the ghosts are flickery, not because it's a cool effect to make it flickery, but because Again, they're trying, they only have actually two of these graphics to be able to move around and do things with. So what they do is they alternate. On alternating frames, they'll draw one ghost and another ghost. The other ghost, the other ghost. Uh, the graphics are terrible. The sounds are terrible. Everyone really hated this, but I think they sold millions of copies anyway because it was Pac-Man. <laughs> um, here I actually got all four ghosts. It's probably the only time in my life I've done that. Um, Later there were somewhat better games because what happened is uh, people figured out better ways to manipulate the software or manipulate the hardware using these scan lines. So all of the, again, all the coding of this is very sort of time, uh, time centric. 
This thing was originally called the Atari Video Computer System because it's all centered around the production of a video signal. And that is, we're talking about an analog TV video signal, which means that it's drawing one line at a time. And so you have code that can run sort of at the top of the screen in kind of a blanking time, and you have code that can be run between each line to set things up. This is Pitfall. This was like the first game that people thought, wow, this is actually good graphics. You had, there was a little bit more detail on some of the figures. There, you have a guy who runs around. He has multiple colors. And again, what this is, it's actually one little sprite graphic. And what they're doing is on the lines between his head and his torso, and his torso and his legs, they're changing the one color that he has. And here they're doing a lot of different things also. They're, so they're, they're using different background and different uh, play field colors. Uh, we saw in the other, the other games like uh, Combat, there was actually just two colors besides the tanks. There was essentially a, what's called a background and a play field. And the same thing is really true here. There are actually only two colors in play most of the time besides the moving sprites. But there, you, there are sort of different vertical sections. So in each kind of slice of the screen, they're using different sets of colors. Here I had a very hard time getting off the rope. <laughs> um, you have to push down, is what I forgot. And uh, here we see these little crocodiles. One of the features that you could have in this is if you could have a player sprite that could be doubled or tripled. So you could have the exact same graphic but spread a couple times across the screen. Um, and this is what is considered to be one of the probably sort of the, the tour de force of the Atari 2600, if you will. This is a game called Solaris, one of the last games probably released for this thing, really. Um, and they kind of, you know, they did, they were able to do a lot with very, very little. This is a full 10 years after the console was released, and I'm sure when, this, when the console was created, no one had this in mind. Um, and so they probably had to do a hell of a lot to make this work, and all of it in probably 4K of, 4K of ROM. Um, I'm going to give you a, an extremely brief tour of 65 assembly, which is, I'm, I'm actually not even going to show it to you, but <laughs> I'm just going to tell you about it. The 6502 had three registers called A, X, and Y. Uh, I mentioned before there are no system calls. You use, these, use these, these registers to load everything into hardware registers to make things happen. Um, the A, X, and Y registers, they're not all general purpose. You can't use them all for the same things. Like if you're going to do math, you have to use the A register. If you're going to add two numbers together, you load a number into A, and you say, hey, I want to I add whatever it is in A with this other number. And then you can take what you have in A and put it somewhere else. It's all extremely manual. And again, timing is key. Everything has to happen at the right time to, to, in order to let the, uh, the uh, sort of assistant chip that actually deals with the video interface, to give that the, the right data to set everything up at the right time. <clears throat> Here's kind of a graph of, or a, a, a video, or a depiction of what the video screen looks like. So the video screen has a whole bunch of horizontal lines that are drawn one at a time. And there's a chunk of time where like on a typical analog TV, you don't actually see the whole picture. You know, we know how many pixels are on a computer screen. But back in the old days, you know, there was roughly 500 pixels across maybe and roughly 250 pixels high. But if you think about an old analog TV, it had dials. You could sort of adjust the vertical and horizontal hold. And no one ever saw the whole thing. There was a lot of overscan. So what this machine did was it drew, and also it actually only drew stuff in this rectangle here. And everything else, so everything above and below was the vertical blank and overscan. When that's the sort of extra time you could do your computation. So that's the things that, would, that all that stuff would run once a frame, and then once per line. So a couple hundred times every frame, you could run a little bit of code to do just a few things. Um, as it says across, you see across the bottom, it shows 76 machine cycles. So that was the whole width of what you had to work with under one line, and every. Every uh, instruction on the CPU took between two and four or five CPU cycles. So you couldn't do a lot per line. It was enough to be able to change some colors, change a graphic, and that's about it. This is a very simple application for the 2600. All it does is show like a rainbow of colors by setting a, a background color every single line. Um, in an ideal world, you would be able to write this in something Say like Ruby, you, you, would, you would call a setup thing and then you have a loop that ran forever. In the loop, you would do some, some start frame calculations, set things up. You'd wait for the vertical blank, which is the time when the screen actually starts drawing. You have another loop that would do some stuff every line and then you'd wait for the end of the line. In reality, what we're dealing with, there's, n there's no room to actually have, of course, a language of an assembly in this. There's just not space for anything. Um, the actual application looks like this. It's not huge. You can't see it. The text is too small. I can show you later if you want. 
once you, once you get the, it is understandable, believe it or not, um, but it's, it's not dense. So the, like the looping construct, you can't see, here's the loop. You have labels, you have go to everywhere. Um, you have global variables, only global variables you have, because there's no memory allocation, there's no, there are no other processes running. The only code running is this, and, you're, and like if, you, if you were to run this in GDB and hit a breakpoint and say, print backtrace, that's only one, that's like, there's no function. Like you're, you're at the top all the time. Um, you can't, there are subroutines in assembly, of course, but in here you actually almost never use them because it took too much time to jump to a subroutine and get back from it. It's better to just put the code all in line. Um, quick case study. This past spring or, or winter, I'm sure everyone saw a Flappy Bird. I made my own clone called Flippy Bit, uh, quite derivative. And it was styled, looked like an old sort of crappy Atari game. Here I actually made sort of a cheat version that just let me keep playing even if I collide into stuff. And so I went this on the App Store and I was like, hey, that's interesting. But then I started thinking, I'd been, I'd been messing with the 2600 and I thought, what would it take to get this to work on the 2600? Yes, that's me playing. But in a minute here, you'll see I actually hit a, I actually hit a wall somewhere. It's cheating. Well, I'm not going to wait for it. Um, so I've made a simple port for the 2600. It's not done. Uh, collisions don't do anything except make the screen <laughs> flash and weird. Yeah, the top, you can go off the top and bottom. It, all, it sort of just rolls around. Um, there's no end game. This just keeps going and going. So this is not a finished game. But like the, the core of it is there, and it's working. And I, thought, I think it's interesting to, to compare some actual like what this means, like what this, what this looks like in terms of actual object code. On iOS, the actual game, the compiled optimized game for ARMv7 is 328K. And of course, you're building on top of Sprite Kit and Foundation Kit and UI Kit, these big frameworks. The whole thing is, is close to 60 megabytes. You can't really make a game that, that in, in terms of the actual code being used on iOS takes less than that. It's just not, it's not really possible. On the 2600, it's ab about 400 bytes. Okay, it's not done. If when it's done, maybe it's 500 bytes. It's just not. It, but so there's. It's interesting to me that that you can do something with a piece of hardware that is, you know, it has its certain targeted uses. And because it's not general purpose, the video the video hardware is not general purpose sprite hardware. It has specific things for a specific subset of games. This thing is well attuned to do to do things. And the thing that I started thinking about is, is there kind of a DSL here? And this, this, this was actually the, the, the name of my talk. I think there sort of is, but you kind of have to know enough assembly to kind of see it. Uh, the, the, all the registers, the hardware registers that you're poking values in, they, they have names. And they're, I mean, they're essentially macros in the, in the assembler. When you learn to look at this code and understand it, you can sort of you can, there is a language, there is a context for everything. Each, each value you push into a specific, specific hardware register, it has meaning at one time that is not the same at another time. It depends on when you're doing it, where in your code you're doing it. Um, that is all that I had to say. Thank you. <laughs>